this morning, we're going to talk about teaching. So I know I give you a form, um, a little test for you to find out what your learning, your learning style is and how um, you can figure it out uh, when you're working with the kids. You can have an idea knowing that you have kids in your classroom that have different way of learning and different way of processing information. And if you never took that test before and you never know what your learning style is, today you'll be about to find out what your learning style is. I saw two more individuals walked in and I don't know if you have one. I Sure. Here we go. So while you guys taking that little test, we're going to talk about teaching. And first we're going to talk about what is teaching. Let's find out what teaching is. Well, teaching and learning, you cannot separate teaching and learning. If there's no teaching, there's no learning. So the definition I have up there, so teaching and learning are tightly connected, and they are. Uh, so questioning what is learning might lead us to what really teaching is. Because if I teach something to you and you don't get something out of it, learning for some reason is not there because you didn't learn anything. So with that being said, let's take a look at what historically what people have said. When I went to um, teaching school and I heard the professor said, um, being in the classroom, it's a place where we're going to impart knowledge into you. And I'm like, ooh, that's deep, impart knowledge into an individual. So I didn't quite understand what the teacher was saying. In true reality, what the teacher was saying is that impart knowledge to instruct someone as to how to do something. And that is teaching and learning combined together because I'm going to teach you how to do something in the process you learn it and you're going to apply it. And it also causes someone to learn or understand something by example or experience. So, with that being said, in the classroom, let's take a look at what teaching means in the classroom. So, teaching every day in the classroom, it's a share work. Even in a Pathfinder setting, when you're teaching an honor, it is a share work because you're going to teach the um, student, oh, this is how you're going to do it. They will respond by but how you give them instruction, and they, if they cannot do it, then you ask them to do it again. So there's a contact back and forth going on with the teacher and the student. So one of the researchers said um, the definition of teaching for him, he just divided in two ways. He said set out with the intention of someone learning something, considering people's feeling, experience, and needs, teaching is only teaching if people can take the information, basically what you teach them, if they can take it into practice and use it for themselves. Now, there's something that struck me there when he says about considering people's feeling. What does it mean by that, considering people's feeling? How many of you in the classroom are teachers? If you're a parent, you're a teacher. <laughs> because homeschool, because learning starts at home. So if you're a parent, you're a teacher. So what does it mean about, what is uh, Mr. Paul saying about considering people's feeling? What does that really mean? Their emotional status. If, they're not, if there's something else going on, they're not going to be focused on that. Exactly. So now the question we can ask, how do we recognize that? Know the children? Well, um, when I taught K-12, I usually stay at the door and waiting for my kids. There was three things I was looking for. I looked at their demeanors, I looked at their face, and I looked at their attitude. If they're walking in a classroom like this and they are still sleeping, or someone says something to them, they're upset, 
and I know I'm going to have a hard day. The second thing, if they walk in the classroom, good morning, Mrs. Nord, how are you today? And they have a you know, perky type of conversation. You know that they are alert, they're wide awake, they're ready to learn. But if they're walking in the classroom, you're like, good morning, so-and-so, you know you're going to have a hard day. Feelings is very important. So in the classroom, that's what I do look for as a teacher because I don't like confrontation with kids. So let's take a look at what makes a great teaching. Research keep going back at those four learning principles. They talk about cognitive ability. We talk about earlier, we have to respect their feelings, right? Talk about subject matter, teaching ta tactics, teaching strategy. Well, I just gave you a learning style, right, you take? We're gonna come back to this one and then we're gonna review this. Now, what do they mean by cognitive abilities? Sometimes we have kids come into the classroom or you have someone come into the Pathfinder. They said, oh, I already completed Companion. Oh, can you tell me what you did? Oh, for example, uh, honor on doing a specific knot. If you completed Companion, you should be able to do that. But oh, why, I don't remember. Okay. Now, can I sit down with you to do it? But if I already do it, why should I do it again? But I want to know if you really know. Now, the subject matter. When you teach um, a student about how to do, I'm going to still stay in the setting of um, Pathfinder. If we have to teach them in honor about cooking, cooking, there's different aspects of cooking. Although from different culture, the way we cook our food is different, but there's a certain procedure that you go to, a certain step. You don't pour all the cup of the art, uh, salt or all the cup of pepper in there. You have to measure it. You have to be able to know if it's going to be tasting good because your palate's going to tell you. Can someone else eat that food? So therefore, reading instruction and giving instruction, it is, it is a tactic of teaching. Teaching strategy. I can have some, when I cook my beans, I love my beans to be soaked first and then cook it. And other people, they don't have to do that. Those are the strategy that you can use. But do you come back to the same um, um, result? Yes, because at the end, the book, it would taste different, but the beans gonna be cooked somehow, right? So those are all type of strategies. Those are examples that we can talk about. Now, when this is a, a, a list of instructional learning principles, say for instance, when instructional principle or learning principles, um, you must start with a goal. What do I want the student to know? You cannot just throw in things at the student. You must have a goal. And the goal that you have you must be able to provide the, the student must receive the information you provide them and for them to process the information. You have to think about the topic, the lesson, meaning the planning of the lesson. You must have a goal and you must have a guideline. If you have kids that are in fifth grade and third grade and fourth grade level in the same group of kids that you teach in a Pathfinder Honor, you must take in consideration their abilities. Because what the fifth grade can do, the third or the fourth grade might not be able to do. So meaning that the guideline that you're gonna use is gonna be a different approach to, with the one in third grade. And I can never understand. Teachers who can teach three different grades in their classroom, I give them praise and glory because I know I can't. Oh, no, I can't <laughs> because you go into a lesson, you have to prepare that lesson to three different levels. And it's a lot of work. One day I had the, uh, well, I did not have a choice. I had adults. I was teaching adults. So um, in my opinion, adults come to the classroom with experience and they have ability. They're going to pay attention and all that. That was not so for me that day. Uh, why did I take that assignment? I don't know. Was looking for some money, just finished grad school. You know, you have to pay those financial leads, so I needed a job. So I got a job at Kennesaw State University teaching adult. 
And I was told that we have 21 students in the classroom. So I decided to give a learning style. I wanted to know what everybody can do. So at the end of the learning style, um, a student came to me and said, I think I need to draw about this class. You are going in a level that I'm not there yet. And I said, why? She said, well, you know, um, when I fill out the application, I put all my work experience, but I did not put my academic experience in that. I said, so what is your academic level? And she said, well, I will say, I finished, I dropped out of high school, but I took the GED. I don't think I'm really pre ready for that class. So I did not want her to really to drop out of the class. So I said, why don't we work something out? So I had to prepare two different sets of lessons. Kid you not, it was a nightmare. But here's the challenge. At the end, she stick with it. She was, I was impressed. By the time the semester is over, I didn't have to do two lessons because she wanted it. So she worked hard. So it is important when you can recognize what level your kids are and then how to present the information. So you have to prioritize learning. And in that lady's situation, that's what she did. She came to me every day, every, uh, every class. After class, she said, so what should I focus on first? And I said, well, what you need to focus on is boom, boom, boom. I give her outline, and I give her, I said, you know what? A steady guide might be good for you. And she took everything that I give her and then make it work. And you have to provide a learning assessment. You cannot give the kids, tell them, oh, the Bible says this, 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 and you don't tell them where it's found in the Bible and then how they can apply it. And then you need to go back and ask them, so what did you learn? How did you apply it? That's a part of assessment. Um, and you have to communicate the goal uh, that you want the kids to accomplish by the time um, they finish that um, lesson or that lesson and then uh, not or whatever you are teaching them. So for instance, you're teaching them about, um, Jordan knows that very well. They go um, climb the mountain. These young people, I give them, Oh, my blessing, but I couldn't do that. So they usually set at something, oh, we're going to start right there. This is where we're going to go. But if people know where you're going to take them, they have an idea of how they can manage to reach there. So you definitely have to keep your structure, your goal, and the assessment in the forefront. Now, we're going to talk about knowledge. Remember at the very beginning, I said, Teaching and learning, they go hand, hand, hand. So what about knowledge? What does it mean when someone say that I know this? What are the dimensions of knowledge? So now be mindful that the purpose for that is to know that how people can receive and absorb information. It is still in the concept of teaching. Because remember, you are teaching them to help them learn something that they can apply. Now, this is what psychology talk about learning. They said learning is relatively permanent changes in behavior, but about practice or experience. So another definition they give, this is acquisition of skill and attitude of le learning something, and um, which is referred to learning. So you teach them and they learn the things. So and it, sometimes we do have people from different countries who have a, uh, who their primary language is not English. Oftentimes, we don't pay attention to that because what they learn, their primary learning language, for example, mine is French. When I came to the United States, I was about 16 years old. I already graduated from high school, getting ready to go to college. And my brother, my oldest brother at that time, he was at Boston University. He said, you know what, you're still young. I think it would make sense for you to go back to high school and do one year of high school because you did take English for five years. The way they speak here and the content, it's different. You might not be able to make it. Praise God, he did say that. Because when I got to the classroom, they did not understand. I could not understand them, they could not understand me. 
but they knew that I could learn. So what the teacher did, she sat down with me and did an assessment to see where I was and eventually gave me the things that I needed to know more, which is conversation. I could read, I could write, I can understand, but communicate what I just put in the paper, it was not there because in my country, I was speaking French all the time. I, I am in the country now, all they're doing is English. It's, that's all, and then you have to be able to say what you, what you put in the paper in English. So we must take, um, pay attention to our second language learners by looking at their behavior, the, pro the way they process information and how they communicate the information back to us. So the meaning of learning and knowing, then again, was the same process. I know English, but I could not explain it to someone else. I could read something, I could do the work, but I could not tell them how much I know. So we process or construct our own knowledge in a way by we connected to our own experience, our primary knowledge, when a child come to the classroom or a child come to your club, say for instance, you have a child come from Peru or whatever, whatever they probably cover in their country is it, gonna be somewhat similar than what we cover in the United States. So then we must then again do another set of assessment to see how they're learning, how much they really learn about that subject before we move on to something else. So they have to be able to construct their own knowledge by connected to ideas and basically the material and um, the strategy that you're using in the classroom. Now, I'm gonna give you a quick moment, if you already did your learning style, um, to go back to the last page and compare that to figure out what your learning style is before I move on to the next slide. You know what would be good? If you guys can be in a group of four or five, and then you can compare your learning style with someone, and then trying to teach them about, trying to teach them about something to see how you, you learn and how they learn. Let's just take a few minutes to do that, not more. So, if I can have everybody's attention. So basically, did you learn something new about your learning style today? You did? Um, I was curious to know if anyone doesn't have like a balanced mix of all, all these different learning styles. Oh, we have several people who have a balance with all three. Yeah, but are there, are there, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm wondering, if there's someone that don't have... She doesn't. I only have one C. Really? Yeah, she doesn't. It's amazing. Seriously? How much hands-on are you? Very hands-on. Um, do you like people telling you how to do things? Like basically giving you instruction? But would you like to, you prefer write, um, read it and do it yourself? So you're a visual learner. You're A. You are A. Yes. Really? That's odd. Okay, anyone, um, Jordan um, asked a very specific question. Um, I find out several people who rely on all three, but the third one, kinesthetics, is more like a way of survival. Like if, it, if they cannot get it from visual or hands-on, then they rely on kinesthetic to get it, to learn what they are looking for. This gentleman down here, however, we've been having Zeke. Zeke, Zeke yeah. okay. Zeke have a hard time figuring out which one is his learning style. But he, we talk about cooking, and he find, we just find out that he is a hands-on, and he can also be a, a visual and kinesthetic learner, which is pretty uh, much he can rely on either or for him, but the visual learner, he's very heavy in visual learner. Yeah. Yes? Can, can you speak to where some subject matter necessarily 
aligns better with the specific style. So cooking is, in my interpretation anyway, just naturally aligns itself better with the kinesthetic, physical touch. The hands-on versus, versus mm -hmm. um, molecular theory. Whoa. That is, is you can't touch it. No, you cannot touch it. You have to probably read it and then, or hear someone telling you. Right. Um, it, it's somewhat the same way with math. Math, visual, and kinesthetic is very good because you can manipulate some um, object to figure out a problem. But someone can read the instruction to you, you can hear it. But at the same time, if someone come and just say, oh, this is how you should do it, that hands on basically nail down um, what you really, what you did not understand prior to that if that makes any sense. Yes. I think math was always easier for me because once I got the concept down, like if I'd done it. Yeah, visual I kinesthetic. Had the, I had the concept down. Uh -huh. But history or English was difficult because you have to hear and it's all based on what you've heard. That's the content. Yeah. Then again, your cognitive ability must be able to um, analyze what the, when you read something, you know, sometimes those passages, they are so long. The information is there, but your mind, you are looking for specific things, like you're very heavy in math. In math, it's just like one, two, and three, hey, this is the answers. You can show different ways that you can get your answers, but with reading, you must find a connection with what they are saying in order for you to absorb it and they be able to explain it to someone else. Yes. Not even on hands-on? Not even hands-on. I'm actually kinesthetic, auditory. Auditory? Okay. So, um, with that being said, what kind of steady habits you have? Especially you with content by reading. I, I really like writing it down. You're writing it down. So you want your mind to take, your eyes to take a picture of what you write down like and then to be able, yes, you probably use different color of pen. Like red, okay, this one, I got it down. Yellow, I probably need questions. I have questions and I need answers. Usually if I, if I can like, mess around with it, I have an easy time. You got, okay. And I find out people with kinesthetic learning style, bright neon colors, it's best for them. I don't know what about it. It's just like it's the light. I don't know that it's the color itself. But I have some of my students, this is, those are the colors that they use for them to go back to, um, to remember what they have learned and say, oh, that's what I did. This, I nailed this down. They use bright colors, like neon green, pink, amazing. So, let's, so um, with that being said, we're gonna move into the next one. We talk about learning style. We know they have two basic learning style. Now, when we're teaching kids or adults, we must also take into consideration the learning style. You can reproduce what I just gave you today and do a quick assessment with your students. Even with adults, some adults don't know. They don't know that this is how I see things. Some of them said, well, I cannot learn. I cannot read. Don't even ask me to do this. But if they know that, it's okay if you don't know how to read, but you can provide information. You can absorb information. You can retain information. Yes? I have an example. I homeschooled my four biological boys. Yes. And they were all within five years of age. Okay. And I, I can't tell you which one did which, except for the last one. One, when we were during, doing Bible verses, learning them, long passages, you know, chapters of mm -hmm. the Bible, one had to write it down and write it down and rewrite it down and rewrite it down. So obviously, he's a visual I learner. One had to just keep repeating it and hearing it, and they would do it by that. My last one couldn't do either of those. He had to stand there. I'm not kidding. This is really weird. He'd stand up and he'd go like this with his leg. That's uh, he's doing and a strategy. He, That's his strategy yeah. to remember so he it. Had to have movement with it. You see, a child like that would do very well in music. He really? <laughs> at all. But, but I had to figure that out. And at first, it frustrated me. 
Because I was like, Jacob, just sit down. You'll be able to learn it better. But no, he's brushed his, brushed his teeth the same way. That foot, bam, 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 bam. Because for him, that's a, a reminder. Yeah, that's how he concentrates. And so we have all of our pathfinders, and we're going to have different mixes. Obviously, everyone's going to have a bit of each, and that's what we're seeing, right, when we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have to see what is kind of their utmost learning style and, and aim towards that. Mm -hmm. And it's it, going to be frustrating because we, if we don't learn that way, we're going to have to just keep the system or whatever, but it's and, too with it. Thank you for bringing that up. This is what is really, this is the biggest problem in education. You see, we come up with the European mentality that a child should be sitting on a bench, you know, on a chair, and with a pencil, you must sit in straight to be writing down and things like that. But not everybody do that. When I taught third grade and fifth grade, even my principal, I know he was not too happy with me, but it was not about him, it was about my students. So what I did, I had a bunch of beanie bags in my classroom, and I have different center, different corner. I said, if you cannot sit still, find a corner. And all I did is moving around the classroom throughout the whole time, make sure that they were doing what they're supposed to be doing. The only time I required everybody to sit together, it's when we were doing reading. Because at that time, I'm only reading one book. But as long as they can do their work, I have children that could not um, read. I have to put it on the tape for them to listen to it, because for them listening to it was more important. And if someone else in the classroom is making noise they cannot hear well, then I used to give them a headphone. And so one day I got in trouble. My principal worked in my class and said, what is he doing with a headphone on? And you read into to the other children. And I had to tell him, I said, I'm sorry, sir. He cannot function. He cannot concentrate. When I'm reading to the other kids, he cannot figure things out. He cannot get the concept, he has to have his headphones so that he can concentrate. Those kind of things. And we have to be aware of that. Education, it's an environment for kids to learn. It's not an environment where they are going to feel uncomfortable. If they're uncomfortable, they will not learn. For me, if I'm doing something and math, math is not my strong suit at all. Doing math because I love music and I play music, that's what I do with my foot. My foot will go like this or my hands. And all I'm doing is just I'm finding my comfort zone for me to concentrate to be able to figure out that math problem. So, yes. Bounce. Mm -hmm. bounce some when they're moving. You know, I mean, she obviously has rules. But they can bounce some and get that movement that they're needing while still sitting so that they can do their work. Yes, because at that time, if you don't provide that environment for that child, the child is not learning. The child is getting more frustrated. And those are the kids usually causing trouble in the classroom. Why? Because they cannot get it. Because you're not providing them the um, environment for them to be able to absorb the information. And one of the things I saw also, I had a little girl in, in my classroom um, a few years ago. She had to have a blanket tied around her arms and then sitting with the blanket, rubbing her cheek with it while we're doing math. And I couldn't figure it out what was the deal. The moment it was math time, she pulled out the blanket and kids would make fun of her. And I'm like, no, don't do that. You mind your business, let her do her own thing. And it was when I sat down, I said, so why do you need that? She said, you know, I did not like multiplication table. The only way I could learn multiplica multiplication table is that blanket my, my grandma made for me. Guess what? In the blanket, you have different squares. So for her, each square, when she was going out, finding the answer, she goes at it and she remember what it was. So provide people an environment where they can find a comfort zone that's sweet, their learning style, their learning ability, that's what we need to do. Yes? Um, I knew a college student, it's an odd thing, my parents went to college when I was a teenager, so I watched them. And one of my mother's classmates, nursing, she would walk up and down the halls of the dorm with her book studying. She, my mother said she was a straight A student, so it impressed me that, okay, that's how you learn stuff, and she would move while you were going down. Apparently, though, it may be that was 
style. That's, that was her style. But she would walk with her books constantly and study, and she was top of the class. Yes, because for her, that works for her. And I do believe when we provide that, um, um, when we provide kids with that, I call it, for me, it's strategies. Whatever strategies work for you, let's do it. Because if she didn't do that, going back and forth down the hall, because every time, probably every lap she took down the hall, there's something she remember. And then her brain, when she go um, sit down taking the test, she's going to remember that. My daughter, one of my daughters, um, oh my gosh, she does not like state tests. She, she doesn't like those state assessment tests. Whenever it's time for her to take the assessment test, you, you see her, she's going, I hate it, I hate it. I said, Vicky, what did you hate the most about the test? She said, I have to sit there and I cannot just relax and lay down because they want you to sit straight and take the test. I said, okay. I said, what if you put in your mind a relaxing bench while you're taking the test? She said, that, that is not gonna work, mom. I said, well, pretending you have a lounging bench. The next day was the test, and I called her again, Vicky, remember what we talked about? Pretending. She went and took the test, and she came back. Mom, I got a 95. I said, what did you do? She said, that bench, that imaginary bench, work. Because for her sitting straight and be all that, it was all stressful. She could not get the answers out because she was stressful. Sitting straight like that, she couldn't breathe, she couldn't do it. But have that imaginary lounge bench in her head, she was able to make it through. We see kids these days um, with the technology, with those phones. These kids are so, how would I say it? They are being stimulated constantly. So if you don't give them something to do, and all of a sudden they start feeding, they move around. So because of the nature, the culture that we are in right now, they are being stimulated so much, you have to give them that. You're talking about 12 years, I have a 15-year-old who have to have a pencil in his mouth chewing all the time while he's learning. Yeah, just like that. And I said, why do you need that? He said, but that helped me um, deal with my stress. You're 15, what stress do you have? But then again, I forgot puberty, adolescence, all that's going on. But yes, we have to give them stimulus. I, 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 I wrote an article a um, couple months ago, and I did talk about that. I, I, I seen our new generation, the kids that we have right now, it's gonna come to a point that um, we're gonna have to conform, conform ourselves on how they do things in order for us to teach them, not us to conform just to tell them what they need to do in order for them to learn. Because they're gonna come and tell you exactly what they wanna do and how they're gonna do it. This, this is the nature of the job. Now we're gonna take a look at Jesus, the master teacher. Now, what am I looking into this? Remember, Jesus have a different, Jesus did not have a learning style back in, in his days. Then you're going to say, well, Jesus didn't even need that because he's the master teacher. But how did Jesus really relate to people? And you will find a common denominator with how Jesus come, um, talk to people. So in the book of the Gospel of Mark, Luke, and John, called Jesus at least 45 times teacher, but they never call him and tell him a preacher. Now, remember the definition of teacher? It is someone who's giving information to someone to help them learn something. So, Jesus had a very practical way of teaching, of reaching out to people. 
he used illustration. Jesus talked about, he used illustration, he used stories, he used situation. He also lectured them. Remember when they have the people in the mountain, they sit in there, Jesus talked to them. But there was one thing when I was doing that question in my mind, but how on earth he was able to lecture to all these people, but they understand everything he was saying and they apply it and they accept it. It is the same concept. When we are teaching someone or a child or whomever, we must find a way to relate to that person. If I cannot relate to your situation, I cannot really actually teach you. We don't impart learning in nobody. We help people learn something. Because even a child come to the classroom or to the club with prior knowledge, Jesus knew the people that he was dealing with, their prior knowledge. Not because he was God, because he made that connection. He knows how to talk to Peter, right? So Jesus used symbol, symbolism. Remember you mentioned about, you know, doing those Play-Doh and all these type of things? If this is what's work, that's what we need to do. Jesus used symbols. And he used conversation. He did not just sit there, he just sit there and talk to them. When you talk to people, you learn things about people. You learn about what they feel, how they feel, and they can ask questions back and forth. Conversation is very good. Um, I've seen teachers in my years of um, teaching and training teachers, I've seen teachers just, hey, so-and-so, you sit down and do that, and I'll come back and see how you do. Well, did you give so-and-so an instruction? The instruction may be in the paper, but did you tell so-and-so, this is what I, what I am expected from you, and this is what this subject is all about, and you need to do one, two, and three. You just give the child a sheet of paper with a bunch of questions to answer, but the child doesn't even know what are you looking for, what is the goal, what do I need to do? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus talked to people. He asked questions, and people go back to him and ask him questions. Jesus did repetition. He repeat things. He keep on, and this is the same thing in the classroom. When you have your goal, if you say to the student, the goal, the subject that we're going, we are teaching today, say for example, is math. I want to make sure at the end of this class, you learn how to use multiplication table two and five. You can memorize it or you can utilize it to answer questions that I'm about to give you. But she, at the end of the lesson, the teacher said, remember the purpose of the lesson, it was for you to know how to utilize time two table and time five table when you're doing the exercise I'm about to give you. You have to repeat things to people back and forth. And if they don't know it, they ask you a question, don't think that they're dumb. They didn't get it yet. They're in the process of putting it in their permanent memory. Ooh. So... We talk about Jesus um, practiced what he preached. He did not expect people to come to his class all knowing. He knows that he needed to give them the tools that they need to learn and to move on. So Jesus did not just teach them, but the, he also, remember when Jesus was in the boat with the disciple? He also worked with them hands on hands and hands. Um, I often find myself in my classroom, you know, take off my shoes and I sit on the floor with the kids. Okay, let's figure this out. Because math is not my, I'm a big in math. So when I'm teaching third grade math, you think that, my goodness, I'm more nervous than the kids because I'm like, if I don't get it, how could I teach it to them? So I keep on repeating it to myself. So finally, when I said, did everyone understand? Yes, you don't have to worry about it. We're going to do the uh, the homework, but I keep on moving around the classroom because I know if one of them miss any information out, I'm going to have to look back at myself. Oh, you didn't do a good job. They didn't understand it. So you got to be hands-on, practice what you said, and allow the kids to have um, the information. And mentally, I don't like memorization, which that's what I grew up with, uh, but with the different type of learning style, people find different strategies, things that like probably using Play-Doh, using a blanket, that they can remember things. 
that's what I do. If this is what it takes, that's what we do.